going to talk a little bit first of all about traditional chemotherapy and then about how we might make the chemotherapy that we have work better, how we can augment it. Then we'll talk a bit about targeted therapies, which are something that we hear about a lot in the media for diseases at other sites in the body. And then we'll talk about immunotherapy, which is, as I've said, this business of trying to stimulate the body's own immune system to attack tumour cells. And again, that's hitting the headlines a lot recently. And then I want to talk more generally about clinical trials and, and why there don't seem to be so many in brain tumours. So traditional chemotherapy works by disrupting the DNA. So this is our DNA. So we, we know about the double helix of the DNA. And this is, this is a, a picture of the DNA double helix. So there's all these molecules all held together by these base pairs. And what chemotherapy does is it disrupts, it gets in between these double these double helices and it gunges up the DNA. It forms bonds which causes breaks in the chain. And if there are breaks in the chain, the cell, when the cell tries to divide, instead of dividing, it dies. This is everybody's favourite molecule. This is temozolomide. That's, the, that's the, uh, the chemical symbol for temozolomide, the nitrogens and oxygens and carbons. And that's how the molecule looks with the big, the, the reds are the oxygens and the blues are the nitrogens, anybody who can remember any O-level chemistry. Um, but as we know, chemotherapy works well for many people in many situations. However, it does cause collateral damage because it's not completely specific to the tumour cells. And so you do get damage in other tissues, particularly the bone marrow, where the blood cells are being made and the cells are turning over quickly. It gunges up the DNA in there as well and causes the cells which are trying to turn into white blood cells or platelets to die off and that's why sometimes when people come back to clinic their blood counts are still low and we need to give things a little longer to recover. Quite a lot of drugs, chemotherapy drugs, don't cross the blood-brain barrier and so there are lots more options for treatment of chemotherapy for something like breast cancer than there are for brain tumours. And different tumours have different sensitivities so some chemotherapies work for some people, don't work for others. So what can we do? Are there any new chemotherapy agents coming out? Well, to be honest with you, not really. A lot of the chemotherapy drugs that we've had have been around for a long time, and it's a little bit like antibiotics. You know, there aren't so many new antibiotics coming through, so we've got a, but we've got quite a large number of chemotherapy drugs which we could be using. And there are alternative approaches. So could we make chemotherapy work better? Well, very possibly, and that's one of the things I want to talk about. Can we work out which drugs might be most effective in each individual? Maybe. This is something we'd really very much like to do, and this is the subject of a, a programme of laboratory research we're just getting going here in Manchester. Can we increase drug delivery into the brain? Maybe. Because again, the brain sits inside the blood-brain barrier, which is designed to protect it from nasty, toxic things like chemotherapy or, or infections. But it means that we can't get the drugs in. And so, again, there's a lot of work going on, not so much here in Manchester, but, for example, in Birmingham, looking at ways of getting the drugs into the brain better, usually by doing it at the time of surgery. But that's the one I really want to talk about, because that's what there are, there are a number of clinical trials ongoing in that area. And so one of the very good agents for doing this in brain tumours, in gliomas, are called PARP inhibitors. And PARP inhibitors are used in breast cancer and in ovarian cancer. And what they do is they make chemotherapy more effective. And the way they do that is, I showed you the picture, this picture of our DNA double helix. And what we can see is that when we've, we've got the two, the two strands of DNA and they're all joined with these cross links, chemotherapy can cause a break in one of the strands. But, it takes, but the body can repair a break in one strand. To make the cell die, you need to have a break in both strands. And so PARP is the enzyme which repairs the single strand break. And so the PARP works, single strand breaks repaired, cancer cell continues to live. But if we can switch that enzyme off, that break is not repaired, the chemotherapy can then go on and make a second break, and at that point the cell dies. And laparib, and also the, these strand breaks here, I've talked about them being caused by chemotherapy, but they, might, they could equally well be caused by radiotherapy. And so there's a big programme of work led by Professor Chalmers in Glasgow looking at PARP inhibitors in brain tumours, grade 4 gliomas, of, at, at various stages. At the moment, there's a study called Operatic, which is open and recruiting. 
for people whose disease has come back after their initial surgery and radiotherapy, and that's combining the PARP inhibitor with temozolomide. <coughs> that study's been, it's been very slow because it's actually proving fairly toxic. The PARP inhibitor is making the temozolomide work super well, and that's actually increasing side effects, but we're getting there, so we're close to getting, getting the correct dose. Um, but in the pipeline, there are trials with that drug as initial treatment, so just after people are first diagnosed with radiotherapy, and comparing that to radiotherapy combined with temozolomide. There's also studies underway combining it with radiotherapy and temozolomide and alaparib versus radiotherapy and temozolomide on its own, or with radiotherapy on its own with radiotherapy with alaparib. So as you can see, there's lots of that. This is sort of a program of work. Professor Chalmers has spent years and years and years of his life researching all of this and hopefully it's finally coming to fruition. This trial is open but there's no results of this yet. As I say, we're still looking for the correct dose. These trials aren't open but they're, they're in the pipeline and uh, this one was just, just uh, received funding from the Cancer Research UK fund. So that was great news. So what else can we do to make temozolomide work better? Well, a lot of people know about the cannabinoids, and cannabinoids have received, again, there's been a lot of, a lot of people read about cannabinoids and their effect on tumours on the internet. And this is where the cannabinoids sit, really. What they do is, as far as I understand it, is that what they, they aim to do, again, is to make chemotherapy work better. And again, you may have read things that they may work on their own. I'm not sure, but certainly within the clinical trials that we are doing, it's, again, looking at their ability to augment the activity of chemotherapy. Sort of, it's been around for a little while, this. It was first reported in about 2004, maybe sooner. They think it interferes with the, the, the VEGF pathways. So those are the pathways in tumours that stimulate blood vessel growth. And I'll show you a picture of that in a minute. There are two components within the cannabis. So that, those are cannabis leaves. Um, one is called THC, and that's what gives the sort of the classical drug effect. So make people feel a bit high, a bit spaced out. Um, but the other one is this CBD, which seems to be the active element when it comes to treating cancers. But you need both. And one of the areas of research is what's the correct ratio of this. In the laboratory studies, it seemed that the cannabinoids on their own inhibited, slowed down the growth of the cells a little bit, but not loads. And it was only really when you combined them with the temozolomide that it, they seemed to work in a meaningful way. There are ongoing trials. Uh, there are a couple of agents. What I've got here are, are photographs of Sativex. So some people, and we'll hear from them in a little while, are on the Sativex study. And Sativex is the cannabinoid given in a little, you can see it there, it's a little aerosol spray that people spray onto the, the inside of their cheek. Or there are also, there's also a study opening yeah. using cannabinoids given intravenously. But that's, again, that's a, a first diagnosis. Oops. Um, there also seems to be some evidence that if you combine cannabinoids with radiotherapy, that that might be a good thing to do as well. So again, it's an area of, of ongoing development. There are questions about how you should best give the temozolomide. People who've had temozolomide most often have it five days a month. With the cannabinoids, you seem to need more prolonged exposure, maybe sort of 42 days at a time. So again, there's lots of questions, but these are in clinical trials, so we'll, we'll see what fruit that bears. We talk about targeted therapy. So we've talked about chemotherapy, which works fairly non-specifically, really, to try and gunge up the DNA and kill the cells when they try to divide. But the other one, another strategy is what we call targeted therapies, or these are sometimes called novel agents. And what these aim to do is get to the cells upstream and turn off the cells that are telling the tumour cells to grow and divide. And this is actually a slide, this is actually from bowel cancer. But what you can see is that there's a receptor expressed on the surface of the cell. That then tells a whole, the cell to do a whole load of other things, make new blood vessels, grow, don't die even when it's abnormal, and spread into adjacent areas. If we block that with a drug, it turns off all of those things, and all of those things don't happen. And so that's a very elegant idea, which has had some success in other types of diseases. But again, it doesn't work in everyone. If the if this is what we call mutated, so if this is misshapen, the drug doesn't bind, so it's not everyone benefits from this treatment. 
But why, so that we use that in, in bowel cancer and some other cancer types, melanoma. Why don't we use it in, why can't we do that in the brain? Well, because there's huge variability between tumours. So it's in bowel cancer, you often find that if you've got that particular receptor, all of your tumour cells have that receptor. But in the brain, there's huge variability even within one tumour. So some of the cells may have that receptor and some might not. Brain tumours are very, very clever at escaping these blockades. So they, get, they become resistant very quickly. And so you may block one path that's telling the cell to grow, but the cell very swiftly sorts itself out and just grows via a different path. There are lots of different pathways, so blocking one or even two may not be the answer. And so what you can see there is that's an example of even if you block that one or if that one's not able to, to be activated, the cell just finds loads of other things to do to make its growth possible. But what we are doing in the brain is, this is called the EGFR receptor. And in bowel cancers, you just block the EGFR receptor straight. And it works well. For about 50% of people, it works for 6 to 12 months. So it's not wonderful, but it's, it's not bad. In the brain, it's been less, that using that class of drugs has been less successful. But what we are doing now is using that EGFR receptor as a target for other things. And one of the new trials that's coming through is taking a drug that binds to that receptor and what then happens is the drug is sucked inside the cell and it's a chemotherapy drug so hopefully it's delivering the chemotherapy right into the middle of the cell where it's wanted and needed. So that will be very interesting. That trial is opening in the autumn of this year again in people with grade 4 gliomas, glioblastoma, whose disease has come back after initial treatment with radiotherapy and chemotherapy. Um, so it's a little bit like, you know, sort of rolling a hand grenade into a tank, hopefully, and you roll it in quietly and then it explodes once it gets in there. That's the theory. So it would be, you know, I'm very pleased that that's coming into trial, so we'll see. Not everybody's tumours express this receptor. Only about 30 or 40 percent of people's tumours express this. And the way we know whether or not it's expressing it is we look down the microscope and we stain it with a stain. And if all the tumour cells show this sort of deep brown staining, that's got the receptor. And if it, they don't, it hasn't. So not suitable for everybody. But again, it's, you know, it's a new treatment. It's a new approach in an area where I think we're all agreed. We desperately want more treatment and better treatment. This is what I mentioned before, this business of trying to turn off the blood vessel growth. This is bevacizumab or Avastin, some of you may have heard of. So what this does is, this again is another drug that works on the signalling. So this time it works on the signalling in the blood vessels. VEGF stands for vascular endothelial growth factor and what it is is it signals the tumour to grow new blood vessels and by giving this drug you can turn that off and so you start off with a tumour, it gets fed by blood vessels, it gets fed, it gets fed but then you turn that signalling off and the theory is that the blood vessels stop forming and the tumour sort of withers and dies. Again, wonderful idea um, because we know that grade 4 brain tumours express higher levels of this VEGF than normal cells. Possibly of some benefit, it's a complicated story. It was approved for use in America but not in Europe because the Americans accepted the evidence that was presented for its benefit. The Europeans didn't. They have done the big definitive trial looking at lomustine chemotherapy. Half of people got lomustine on its own, half of people got lomustine with bevacizumab. That closed in about November of last year, so we're waiting to find out the results of that. Um, there are also studies, but, so bevacizumab is still in clinical trials. It's not, in, it's not standard of care, but it is still in clinical trials. And it... Um, so it's still being investigated and there's also drug companies trying to develop drugs to see if we can make the radiotherapy to see if we can make the bevacizumab work better so this is what this is the interesting area when they every time it comes on radio four in the morning they said oh look we've cured lung cancer today so it sounds to me like last week they cured lung cancer and the week before that they cured melanoma this is what they're nearly always talking about immunotherapy to see if we can use the body's own immune system to attack cancer cells the body has a very advanced immune system to fight off infection and, and when we give vaccinations we, we encourage the body to, to fight off in subsequent infections. And so we've got T cells which attack the tumour and we've got tumour cells. 
But when tumours grow, part, part of the issue is, amongst many other things, but it's because some of our T cells aren't active enough, but also because our tumour cells are too good at escaping. So can we do things to try and make these more active and these less evasive? And so that's a massive, this is a massive area of research and, and uh, clinical development at the moment in cancers of all kinds, including in the brain. Just bear with me at the minute for a minute. This slide looks a bit busy, but I'll just, worth spending a bit of time with. These are our tumour cells, so nasty looking sort of irregular tumour cells. And they have little antigens, little molecules, so little sort of abnormal fragments that break off. They get taken up by a cell in the body called a dendritic cell that recognises them as abnormal. The dendritic cell then tells the T cell, so the T cell is the killer cell, look, I want you to, I'm showing you this, I want you to recognise it and remember it for the future, and then I want you to go back and attack the tumour and kill it. And when you read about some of these trials, what a lot of these trials are trying to do is upregulate, just make this whole process more effective by intervening at different stages. We read about some vaccines. What those are doing is increasing the amount of antigen that's given to these cells to see if they can, they can make those more active and make them produce more T cells or more active T cells. DCVAX is trying to make these cells from people's tumours themselves, and that's a very complex process that involves sending samples to Germany and all sorts of things. There's another class of drugs which are given intravenously, which try to increase when this cell is telling this cell to become active, that try and encourage this process to be, to be upregulated, to be better, faster, stronger. Or we've got, and then what happens is that even when the T cells are activated, they come back to try and attack the tumour, but there's a whole other set of agents that are trying to make the tumour hide, that are trying to stop that happening. So if we, there's another class of drugs that tries to turn off that tumour uh, tumor resistance there. So that's the whole pathway. That happens initially in the brain, that happens in the lymph nodes, probably in the cervical lymph nodes, that's in the bloodstream. Lots and lots and lots of different drugs, lots of different things going on to try to work to the same end which is to increase the numbers and activity of these T cells and to reduce the evasiveness of the tumour cells. And that's a massive area of work. And, and again, a lot of what you hear about in the media is to do with this whole field. Sounds fabulous, but again, nothing's ever that simple. If it was, we'd have made lots more progress by now. Brain tumours have huge numbers of different antigens, so all the cells are not the same. They've got lots of ways to escape and to hide. Some of the drugs have other, can be potentially, have potentially quite nasty side effects because you're turning off the body's immune system and that's not very good for you. Mother Nature gave you an immune system for a reason. And it's unlikely ever to make big lumps of tumour melt away. So if you've got a big mass, it's, it's not the kind of thing that's going to make big lumps shrink because you're doing it at this very cellular level. Having said that, there are various trials coming up. Susan Short, Professor Short in Leeds, has a laboratory, and again, she's just got a big grant funded for, some, um, for a new vaccine study, which we hope will open sometime in 2016. There are international trials coming through. The drug companies, in parallel with developing these drugs for breast, lung, melanoma, renal cell, are also including brain tumours in their to-do list, which, again, is fantastic, because for a very long time, Brain tumours weren't of any interest to the drug companies. They weren't common enough. They were too difficult. So the fact that the drug companies are now trying to develop in this area is wonderful. Uh, and again, there's a combination. Some of them are, are at relapse when disease has grown back after initial treatment. Some of them are at, uh, are at the beginning, just after diagnosis. So more research in this area can only be a good thing. So lots of optimism. That's all very well in theory. But what about in practice? Which patient groups are these drugs for? Well, I have to say they are mostly for glioblastoma. They are mostly for the grade 4 gliomas. And they, because they tend to start, and they tend to start with the drugs in people whose disease has come back after initial treatment, and usually only at first relapse, I have to say, because further down the line, people may be less well, or, or the waters may be more muddy. From the trial point of view, what they want is nice clean data. They want to know for certain whether or not these drugs are really making a difference. And for that reason, people have all got to be at the same stage. But they then tend to move into the first line treatment, usually in combination with radiotherapy. And as we said, there's some trials coming through with that. 
Why isn't there more access to entering clinical trials? Well, again, there has been a lack of trials. We can only put people into trials if we have trials to offer them, and there haven't been that many trials. Again, you know, if you look at something like breast cancer, there's scores of trials, many, many fewer in breast cancer. Often the trials are small with very few places. So in cohort studies, what that means is that we give the drug at a certain dose to, say, three people. We see how they are for, say, three months to check that they're okay. And then if they're okay, we give the drug to the next lot of three people. But if you happen, if your disease happens to come back or you happen to want to enter a clinical trial in that three-month period when the first three people are in and they're being watched, the trial's not open, can't go in. And the reason for that is to ensure that we're being safe. Narrow eligibility criteria, again, so there's a big tick list. There's, people have got to fulfill certain criteria. And again, that's to ensure that the quality of the data that comes out at the end is truly accurate and that we're getting really very clear answers. So to ensure that we're comparing like with like. And the other thing is that there are, some of the trials are very popular and a lot of these trials are open all over the planet, all over the world, America, Australia, Korea, Vietnam, Israel, all over Europe. A lot of them are open absolutely everywhere. And so if you're only looking for 400 patients, 300 patients, they may actually recruit very quickly. And what happens is that trials have a planned recruitment target. So they say we're going to treat about 400 is quite a common number, 500, something like that. We're going to treat that many patients. And once we get to that number, then that's it. Studies closed. And the reason for that is that these are experimental treatments. We don't want to treat any more people than are necessary with an unproven drug because it might not work, and you might have exposed people to risk or side effects that, that wasn't the right thing to do. But again, that's frustrating because I get contacts from people who say, oh, we really want to go into this trial, and you have to say, I'm really sorry, it closed a few weeks ago, you've missed it, sorry. What about tumours other than glioblastoma? Because obviously glioblastoma is numerically the commonest type of primary brain tumour, but there's also lots of people with meningiomas, with low-grade gliomas. So glioblastoma is grade four glioma. So the glial cells are the supporting cells in the brain in which the sort of the thinking cells sit. So people with lower grade gliomas, grade two or grade three, or people with meningiomas or other types of tumours, for example, in the spine. In those areas, there are undoubtedly fewer trials. And then one of the reasons is because the questions are more fundamental. How should we sequence radiotherapy and chemotherapy? Should we use one or both? Does radiotherapy make any difference at all? We're about to open a major trial in meningiomas where people, after they've had an operation for meningioma, if it's grade two, will be randomised to either active surveillance or radiotherapy. And so we, we're still sort of asking the fundamental questions. And trials like that can take decades to get an answer from. Because they're slower growing, because they're less common, it does make doing trials more difficult. Um, but that, again, that's a challenging area, and it's an area that people working in brain tumours would like to, you know, we're very aware of that. But that's the case at the moment. So in summary, the search for the magic bullet goes on. There are more options and prospects than there were a few year, years ago, uh, but there's no easy answers. But the community is continuing to try. The clinical trials of the new drugs do, do remain very GBM-centric. You know, they're nearly all for the grade four gliomas. But do ask your consultant about clinical trials. They will know there are national trials open in the UK. But we do need to be realistic about the pros and cons. And in a few minutes, some very kind, slightly willing volunteers are going to come and join us on a panel and talk to us about the realities of being in a clinical trial. Thank you very much. <laughs>